All right, so we're going to do two views. The first one is going to be a straight right from Jones, and then the second one's going to be the obvious, uh, the spinning sidekick that landed on Stipe's body and then ultimately ended the fight. Okay, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and tell you right away, I'm not going to be able to play the full thing uh, before and after like you guys have asked uh, because the UFC is pretty bad about copyright strikes this early on. So I'm going to try to keep it as succinct as possible so I don't get a copyright strike. Uh, but we're going to start with his back leg like we usually do. Okay, so when he plants, he shifts those hips. We talk about this a lot. Uh, the kinetic chain starts from the ground, but he does something a little bit different. A lot of times when somebody lands or when a good striker lands and starts to shift their hips, they'll actually shift the weight to the front leg. Jones doesn't do this. He doesn't put a lot of weight on the front leg here to get that. We, a lot of times we see them pivot around that leg that's planted on the ground in the front and it results in hip internal rotation, closed chain hip internal rotation. He doesn't do that. He actually starts to hinge at the hips uh, to give him a little bit more length. Uh, so he doesn't get any like trunk flexion or anything like that. He's actually just hinging at the hips. His spine stays relatively neutral, except for the thoracic spine. So hip switch, boom. And then we start to see that, that hip and shoulder dissociation move. He doesn't get much of the stretch reflex just because it's not a really super powerful punch, uh, except it's coming from Jones, so it's always powerful. But that you can see those, that thoracic rotation if you draw a line between the two shoulders, boom right there. And so also, as he does this, so he, sh he plants on the ground, shifts his hips, so we're now at the lumbosacral spine, we're at the thoracolumbar and thoracic spine when it comes to the kinetic chain, and it's kind of hard to see, but watch his scapular movement here. So it kind of elevates and protracts. Muscles like the serratus anterior are responsible for that movement, uh, and they also have to be really engaged upon impact so it can so it can kind of reverberate all the way through the kinetic chain to receive the impact from the punch as well. It's not just about throwing it, it's about being stable upon contact. And so after the serratus anterior, it's co-contracting co -contracting with muscles like the anterior delt that flex the shoulder and then the tricep that extend the elbow to land right on the button, Stipe. But Stipe's got a really good jaw, as we've seen from him in the past. Haven't seen a lot of them recently, but in the past he's had a, a really, really stiff jaw, so he takes it like a champ. Uh, but one more time, so he shifts his hips, doesn't shift weight onto the front leg like we typically see, but he hinges at the hips, and then extends his hips here. He's got good thoracolumbar, or excuse me, uh, thoracolumbar and thoracic rotation at the shoulders. Good protraction elevation at the shoulder, the right shoulder, and then flexion, a combination of flexion and elbow, shoulder flexion and elbow extension for the long reach that Jones has. Very good job of closing the distance there. I'm starting to run into a problem where I have more questions than I can answer, pertaining to injury advice, biomechanics, anatomy, etc., which is a good problem to have. Up until this point, I've answered almost all of your messages. However, I'm still doing this part-time and seeing patients, so I'm running out of time during the day. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to stop answering questions on my Instagram DMs and my email. So if you have questions for me, I've created a Patreon account. There's only one tier, which is set at $5 a month. So if you just wanna generally support or you wanna be a part of the only place that I'll be answering questions, consider checking out my Patreon. Now back to the breakdown. All right, so the first view we're gonna look at of this kick is an aerial view, which you know I like to use to show the difference between the hip and the shoulder dissociation. And then the, the other view we're gonna show, which I'm sure you guys have seen before, uh, is where he takes the hit to the side, uh, Stipe side. We can see some things from John Jones in that, that view as well, but some of the implications that may happen to Stipe, uh, given the power and the placement of the kick on that left flank. There's some structures over there that don't like to be kicked very hard, okay? So as he shifts forward, I want you to notice the, the angle of the hips and the shoulders. So the hips move forward and they move a little bit, but not that much. Most of the rotation is gonna happen about the thoracolumbar and thoracic spine. We see a lot of, whenever you punch, the hips move first and then the upper body follows when you're taking advantage of that stretch reflex and that really quick movement. But with kicks, it's the opposite. So the shoulders, like we see the ties do whenever they kick, when we broke down Rod Tang and Superlek, they use that, those arms to generate a lot of rotational force or that momentum around that vertical axis that would be his spine in the transverse plane. It's rotating his shoulders and then his hips catch up as he flexes the hip 
and the knee using muscles like the iliopsoas, the TFL, the rectus femoris at the hip, and then the hamstrings. He's also abducting the hip with muscles like the glute med and the TFL to chamber that kick, and then the glute max and the quads are co-contracting to extend the hips and the knees respectively all the way through the kick. One thing I also want you to notice is that this leg is not planted when he makes contact. So potentially the only thing that could have been a little bit more powerful about that kick is if he had maintained his foot planted on the ground. Uh, but we do know that if he were to ro keep his foot planted and not come up onto his toe and he rotated a little too much, then he could have injured his knee. But really good stuff, good chamber, good follow through. I would hate to get hit, kicked anywhere by John Jones in this way. All right. All right, and in this view, you can definitely see the hip and shoulder dissociation again. So watch how much the, the shoulders are rotating about the thoracolumbar and thoracic spine versus how much the hips are actually rotating until he tries to deliver the kick. So the upper body is rotating to create that, that momentum. Then the hips start to catch up. He flexes the hip and the knee at the same time, chambers the kick with the hip abduction as well and then co-contracts the glutes and the quad. But let me shift your attention here to two things. One is the length tension relationship here, the quads and the glutes. We talked about with the flying knee that you don't, think about a punch, right? You don't wanna punch somebody at the end of your range of motion of the punch, but you also don't wanna punch somebody when your punch just starts. And so those muscles are at a prime length tension relationship to, cre to create the most force when the joint is relatively along the 50% of its range. The only thing that could have been done better was for that foot to be planted like we talked about before. I mean, he makes a great contact on the left flank, so he's got, he's got some stuff to be worried about here. I mean, there, there are a couple muscles like the serratus anterior kind of tucked up under the, the, the armpit. I'm not sure if it hit that though, the lat, the latissimus dorsi. You've also got, it looks like, I don't know, maybe around ribs eight to 12. That inferior border can tell us a lot about what level of thoracic spine it's at maybe it hit some of the floating ribs and if it did that he's got to worry about maybe the spleen in that upper left quadrant uh, maybe even given if some of them like the ribs broke and displaced upward maybe you have to worry about a lung uh, being punctured maybe the lower lobe of the left lung uh, and if it, the reverberation was deep enough, maybe even like a kidney contusion or something like that but certainly not something that I would want to see coming at me uh, and hitting me at all. So 